quick. There we go. Um, uh, she'll be followed by myself, Doug Cluck, from NOAA, National Centers for Environmental Information, Regional Climate Service Director, uh, which will I will be followed by Dennis Totti, who will be uh, giving a USDA sort of agriculture perspective on the wetness across the area, uh, followed by Corey Loveland from the North Central River Forecast Center with the National Weather Service, NOAA, and he will be followed up by Kevin Lau from the Missouri Basin River Forecast Center, uh, which is also with the National Weather Service and NOAA. So uh, I'm going to turn it over to Wendy, but before I do, I just want to say at the end of this, if there's time we'll, and if people are willing to stay on, uh, we will answer questions. And let me just say that it, there is a way to ask questions uh, within this format. You can type them in. If you look down on your little interface there, you can type them into the question area or comment if you'd like to comment. Uh, and we'll get to those sort of at the end, <clears throat> um, again, if there's plenty of time. Oh, the webinar is being recorded, and we will hopefully uh, follow up with an email with some other information for those that registered. Uh, we will be having, as you'll see, another webinar in a, a couple weeks on May 16th. So we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. So I'm going to turn it over to Wendy and flip through the slides. Thank you, Doug. I'm Wendy Pearson. I'm from the National Weather Service Center Region Headquarters in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, we presented the first of these kinds of um, flood outlooks back on February 22nd. We updated that information again on March 7th and April 4th, and here we are in early May, and so I want to go over some um, the things that have changed since we had our webinar in April. Today's briefing will be focused on the ongoing flooding in the Midwest, a look forward at the NOAA Climate Services and what they are indicating we can expect for May through July, and how that will impact the hydrologic situation for the Missouri Basin and the Upper and Middle Mississippi. Additional information and forecasts can always be found online at www.weather.gov. What has changed or is new since early April? We want to highlight that we have been experiencing extremely long duration flooding on the main stem rivers, and that is expected to continue. Flood protection that's been in place, that's been trying to hold back high river flows for many weeks, uh, will continue to be stressed. We had an example uh, earlier this week in Davenport, Iowa, um, where the HESCO barriers had uh, some issues and water was able to get into the city of Davenport. So we will continue to update forecasts. Uh, we'll need you to be monitoring that information, both with the weather systems that are expected and then the river forecasts that will be the results of those precipitation forecasts. Um, the Mississippi River in the Quad Cities area is now at around 40 days above major flood levels, and we're expecting a crest early next week uh, to be very close, if not higher, than the 1993 flood levels in that area. The Mississippi River uh, crest that we're forecasting for the St. Louis area um, for the middle, early middle part of next week um, is also out and um, is significant and in the major levels. RFCs are currently using 24 hours of precipitation forecasts in our river forecasts due to the uncertainty of the exact timing and location of the heaviest thunderstorm rainfall. And so we do need everybody to continue to monitor the river forecasts as we change them. The main stem Missouri and Mississippi rivers will probably see several peaks or crests in uh, between now and June. The timing of when those crests happen uh, will be dependent on how much rainfall falls and where it falls. We also want to highlight uh, that there are um, high levels on the Ohio River, and they are expected to make their way down to the Mississippi River in the Cairo area in the middle of May. So we will be monitoring the timing of those high flows coming into the Mississippi as well. Late spring and summer thunderstorms and heavy rain events are more likely to produce excessive rainfall in this time of year. Some areas have saturated soils um, and are currently experiencing flash flood impacts when they receive less than one inches of rain. 
Uh, we saw this last week in the Quad Cities area as well. Uh, they received just under an inch of rain, and the main stem Mississippi uh, rose a foot in just a very short amount of time. Next slide, please. Current conditions are indicating that we still have moderate to major flooding continuing in portions of North Dakota, South Dakota, Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, Kansas, and Missouri. And of course, there's also sites further downstream on the lower Mississippi Basin. We also want to mention that in southeast Colorado, snowmelt flooding has begun. Um, this is a little earlier than normal, and it's the snowmelt is melting very quickly. And uh, so people in, that are concerned with that area need to monitor the situation for the next six to seven weeks. Our region continues to be very vulnerable to flooding due to the very wet soil conditions and the wet weather pattern. Uh, the lakes and rivers are elevated, even if we're not indicating locations in moderate to major flooding. And we want everyone to be aware that when we have convective storms in late spring and summer, those thunderstorms can cause additional flooding and flash flooding. Next slide, please. The USGS has graphics on their web pages comparing the 28-day average stream flows. The upper graphic is from early April, and you'll see the one on the right from May 2nd indicating that we have nor above normal to very wet conditions continuing in the upper um, Midwest, and we have some areas that are now wetter than they were in early April in the lower parts of the Mississippi, Mississippi Basin and Ohio Basins. So above normal flows uh, continue in a large section of the central part of the country. The graphic that I'm showing here has three different time period snapshots. Um, we're indicating a 50% or greater chance of flooding. The graphic on the upper left was from what we demonstrated on March 7th, indicating a large area with the potential for major flooding. By the end of March, the coverage of the locations where we were expecting the major flooding had diminished, but still indicating that we were anticipating um, higher than average or above normal chance for flooding. Uh, the April 30th update on the lower right um, still continues to show areas of concern in the eastern part of the Missouri Basin and the upper and middle parts of the Mississippi. So again, we're expecting um, chances for moderate to major flooding continuing into May, June, and July. Um, flooding chances remain higher and more widespread this year than we've seen in other years. Um, Many people are sometimes commenting recently that, well, it's spring and we get heavy rains, but we want everyone to understand that even average rainfall for this time of year or even slightly above average rainfall for this time of year is causing flooding impacts that are very significant because the rivers are already so high and the soils are saturated. And we do anticipate long duration flooding at these very high levels to continue. Looking at past precipitation over the last 30 days on the left-hand side, you see the purple and pink colors in the southern part of the central part of the U.S. is where we've experienced the heaviest rainfall over the last 30 days. But you will see that the very wet weather patterns have continued over the upper plains and the Dakotas and northern parts of Iowa. And the weather patterns that we've seen in the last seven days have brought a lot of heavy rain being on the right-hand side with that area um, from Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Kansas, Missouri, Southeast Iowa, Illinois, into the Great Lakes, Indiana, Ohio, and Southern Michigan. Looking forward for the precipitation forecast, on the upper left, we're looking for the next 72 hours or days one, two, and three, which would be um, today, Friday, and Saturday. Um, you can see a very heavy band of reds and purples, again, over that area from Texas, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Southeast Missouri, Illinois, Indiana, and into the Great Lakes. Days four and five, um, not as many purples and reds, but you do see higher levels of rainfall expected over the areas that we've had over the last seven days, which again are portions of Iowa, Wisconsin, and Illinois, and Northern Missouri, uh, right where the crests on some of those main stem rivers are going to be very problematic. And looking at days six and seven, again, we're expecting another weather system to bring a lot of heavy rain to the middle part of the country. 
So in summary, this brings all together the next seven days, amount of precipitation, very heavy expected, heavy rainfall for the next seven days across the basins that are already experiencing flooding. And even looking into the next week, week two, there's a chance for two more significant weather systems in the time frames around May 10th through the 12th and May 16th through the 18th. So the message here is that we are expecting the wet weather pattern to continue. This graphic uh, was provided by the Army Corps of Engineers, and it's indicating that for the Missouri River, the flood storage that is being used now is around 52.7%. If you look in the upper Mississippi River, they're at about 16.5%. And the Ohio River indications are there closer around, you know, single digits um, for their storage that is being used right now. And I will turn the presentation over to Doug. Thank you, Wendy. So I'm going to set some context, uh, like we did, uh, oh, I don't know, a call or two ago, on um, the wetness and um, how long it's been going on, if you will. And to be honest with you, this only goes back to April of last year. I say only because... Uh, it was wet in some parts of the, of the country before that even. But just looking over the last 12 months, the upper left-hand um, upper left hand image there shows the ranking of particular areas of the United States from um, 1 to 124, 124 being the wettest ever uh, for a particular year, or a particular period, I should say, April, April of last year through March of this year. And wherever you see green, basically a green color, means it's uh, quite wet. And wherever you see 124, means it's the wettest that's ever been recorded in that particular region. So that's sort of the upper Mississippi, Ohio Basin, and of course the Northeast. But not too shabby in the Missouri Basin either, with 97%. And, uh, uh, or I should say Northern Plains, sort of uh, including Montana, Wyoming. And then down to the uh, lower right, this is broken out by state as opposed to sort of regions. You can see where we rank in terms of that same period, that same uh, annual period in terms of um, precipitation. So very, very wet, of course, wettest it's ever been in Iowa or Wisconsin and Kentucky and then other places uh, you can see. Uh, you also notice that there are some other states around in the top 10. Ohio, Michigan, Nebraska, Illinois, and Indiana, uh, all top 10 wettest years if you just take April through March of this year, April of last year through April, March of this year. That's impressive. Um, I don't know if it's a good thing. Um, in fact, it's probably not, but it's, uh, it's, it's pretty impressive from a climatological record point of view. Looking at a shorter duration, uh, basically this year, January through March, and by the way, we'll get the April numbers in the next week or so uh, updated in these maps. It'll be coming, um, and we'll we'll talk about that later. But anyway, uh, the statewide average temperature ranks so far this year, upper left-hand corner, uh, show that by and large temperatures have been cooler than normal across the upper Midwest, uh, northern plains, and part of the Midwest. Uh, near normal, uh, near normal throughout sort of the eastern part of the Midwest as well. Uh, but looking at the precipitation, unfortunately, uh, not surprising because we've all experienced it. Uh, maybe not record wetness, uh, maybe not record wetness as a whole, but uh, or a, in a particular state, but awfully darn close to it for almost every state in the Midwest. <laughs> And then just looking at March, and that, by the way, was the first three months of the year. So just looking at March by itself, looking at the last full month that we have records for, uh, broken out by state again, we see, again, upper left-hand left -hand, uh, picture, temperatures where it's blue, it's cooler than normal or below average generally. Um, not a lot to say about that other than a little bit of coolness uh, across the area. Uh, more importantly, the state statewide precipitation uh, rankings on the lower right hand corner again where you see green uh, it's been wet and where you see anything close to 124 um, is near near uh, near record uh, so you see Nebraska and Colorado 
but then fairly wet conditions also in South Dakota, um, Missouri, Kansas, you know, top tier um, wetness in those. Um, it's the last 30 day temperature, last 30 and 90 day temperature departures from normal. So this is looking at temperatures for in the upper left hand corner just for April. You see it was cool across the north uh, north and sort of northeast parts of uh, the, the, the center of the country, and then warmer than normal across the southern tier. Um, but if you look all the way back to the end of, well, ba basically the beginning of uh, February through now, uh, you see it's been much cooler than normal, especially uh, north and uh, west. And then uh, again, Wendy showed this a little earlier. Uh, this image is. Uh, where you see reds and, and, and really yellows, uh, this is a total uh, accumulation of precipitation over the last 30 days. So reds is heavy red, heavy rain. Um, green, believe it or not, is less rain. And blues uh, are actually very light precipitation. So uh, you can see there uh, a lot of inches of rain, five, six, seven, eight, and way down in Arkansas, uh, over 10 uh, inches of rain have fallen uh, just in the last 30 days. And then if you compare that to normal, this is a percent of normal map, you see anywhere you have uh, sort of a gray, green, uh, purple, blue, all of that is above normal. Uh, there are places, uh, if you look really closely, if you, there are places in South Dakota uh, that are well over 200% uh, percent of normal. I mean, the whole state is basically over 200% of normal. There are other places in the uh, Upper Peninsula um, at, at over 300%. I guess you could say that also in, in a few places, places in uh, South Dakota as well. So it's, a, again, a pretty impressive uh, precipitation map. Uh, and this is the last 30 days. So you do see a dry slot, if you will, going out through eastern Nebraska, which is uh, good for the most part uh, for a number of places that needed to dry out after that, that March. Uh, March flooding. But it, yeah, anyway. Um, looking at soil moisture, still uh, very widespread above normal uh, conditions in terms of uh, wherever you see green, it's above normal. And wherever you see, and it's really gets, if you will, wetter as you sort of get darker in, in color. Uh, sort of in that same area that got, have gotten a lot of rain over the last year, to be honest with you. And uh, this is the, this is where, this is where what Wendy was saying earlier about uh, an inch of rain or a half inch of rain can cause some problems. Uh, this is why. It's not frozen soil, but it's not. it doesn't accept as much, um, certainly as in normal or drier soils. It will take months for this to uh, dry out. Oh, that's kind of blurry. I'm um, sorry about that. Well, anyway, uh, this is the headwaters of the Missouri. And you see uh, different colors here, different little basins in that. Uh, basically, where you see green color or, uh, yeah, green color is near normal. <clears throat> Yellows are below, reds below. Uh, light blue is above 110 to 120%. But generally, uh, conditions are average to slightly above in most places. Um, but I'd say uh, if you average it all out, it's near normal in terms of uh, snow melt. I think Kevin will probably have more to say about that. That snow melt will continue through at least June. Now shifting to the outlooks as quickly as possible here. Um, I want to mention El Nino quickly because it is it can be a player uh, in terms of what happens across the central part of the country this time of year. There is some correlation with what wetter than normal conditions if El Nino sort of lasts through the summer, which it appears it's going to do. I won't go into great explanation of this, but where you see that red line, that's favoring El Nino conditions in the Pacific through all those periods. Now, those periods, if you don't know what that MAM or AMJ on the bottom mean, that means March, April, May, April, May, June, May, June, July, and it's giving you a percent, uh, that bar graph gives you a percent, like 75% in May, June, July, of El Nino uh, uh, persisting through that period. There is a, 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 like I said, a weak correlation with wetter than normal conditions across uh, the Midwest and Plains during, that, during an El Nino like that. 
Um, others may, may want to comment on that later. So now the outlooks. And, that, and these outlooks do figure, uh, figure in some of those things that we talked about in terms of El Nino and, and wet soils and, uh, uh, and such. So here's the next, here's the week two forecast. In other words, Wendy covered the first week up through the ninth or so. This is looking beyond that, the week beyond that, and looking at the probabilities. These are all pro based, probability based. But generally, what you see there are is a, there is an enhanced probability of below normal temperatures on the left uh, throughout almost the entire, uh, most of the country. And w which means, a, in our kind of speaking language, we call that a big trough or something where a lot of cold air uh, sort of exists. Uh, we also see uh, uh, on the a map on the right a slightly enhanced probability of above normal uh, precipitation across uh, most of the middle part of the country, uh, north central part of the country, except for near normal uh, conditions across uh, Wisconsin, uh, western Great Lakes area into the Midwest. So uh, no, no indication that things are going to dry out drastically or change in a major way. Uh, from the, sort of the conditions we've been seeing lately. <clears throat> this is uh, looking at that same time period that we just looked at, uh, May 9th through 15th, and looking at some of the highlights for um, well, risk, the highest risk of, of precipitation and actually uh, temperature. So the, top, the above image of the United States shows a bunch of, of circles or, or, or areas where uh, the forecasters are thinking that there's a high probability of of, of very heavy rain, uh, and that's uh, sort of uh, western or eastern um, Oklahoma, northeastern Texas, and uh, Arkansas, and then sort of some ovals around that or areas around that which are in lesser probability but still elevated probability of above normal or heavy precipitation. The graphic on the on the on the bottom shows a, a blue line and basically north of that blue line anywhere north of that blue line there's a slight chance uh, for uh, much below normal temperatures during that period same period 9th through the 15th and that sort of fit in with these maps that we're looking here at too uh, there is a possibility and maybe Dennis will talk more about this when we talk about agriculture and impacts of freeze and frost uh, far to the north during that period as well. Uh, May temperatures, May temperature and precipitation probability outlooks, again, um, sort of sticking with that below normal probability across the high plains into the Midwest. You see it, it basically from border to border, Canada to, uh, to, to Mexico. Uh, that's, that indicates that uh, the forecasters believe that for the month of May, the entire month of May, temperatures uh, are are more likely to uh, stay be uh, below normal. And if you look on the right, the precipitation probabilities show that bullseye where we just showed you the bullseye for very heavy precipitation in Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Arkansas, based on that first week or next w or two weeks from uh, from now. Um, plus uh, an indication of continuing wetness across the Midwest during uh, during May. So no real let up there. There is sort of an equal – EC stands for equal chances of below, above, and near normal. So there's not – it could go either way in a lot of those cases. Uh, not saying that – these are probabilities, so we're not absolutely saying that um, there's a 100% chance it's going to be wet across this entire area. All we're saying is it, it's – the probabilities are leaning more that way. The darker the color, the higher the confidence. That makes sense. Looking a little further out at the May, June, July probabilities for temperature and precipitation. On the right, you still see that area of, uh, so for three months, so May, June, July, it, there's still this area in the central plains of below normal temperatures uh, or, or uh, likelihood of uh, below normal temperatures uh, 
warmer than normal conditions further east and equal chances more or less for the lion's share of the north central part of the country. Equal chances being there's not really a high indication whether it's going to be warm or cold or even uh, near uh, normal. Unfortunately, the uh, image on the right shows uh, enhanced precipitation across almost the entire area except for the green, uh, Great Lakes and uh, highest probability, of course, as you can see, the darkest greens over Wyoming, northern Colorado. Um, of course, it, during this period, that could be early, it could be any time during that period or across that entire period of May, June, July. Um, and then looking one month for, further along, June, July, August, I won't say exactly the same pattern because we've kind of shifted the temperature to uh, equal chances across most of the, the north central part of the country. But the, the wetness, the thought is now that that wetness signal will continue. So the probabilities are still elevated or enhanced, I should say, uh, wherever you see green. So the summary in the long term, or long term out, summary for the long term outlooks is uh, May, May through June. Uh, we should remember that is the climatological wettest time of the year on average for this part of the country. Average rainfall, as Wendy said, and I'm sure uh, will be reflected from both of the hydrologists uh, going to speak, will, con will continue to cause flooding because of the current and antecedent, if you will, conditions. May, better chances for above normal precipitation. May through July, continued uh, chances for above normal precipitation. Um, and then finally, just again, El Nino uh, could be a potential contributor to continued, continuing wetness across the area. Now, I'm going to shift over to Dennis and uh, put myself on mute. Uh, Dennis is going to give us, Dennis from the USDA's Climate Ag Hub out of Ames, Iowa, is going to give us a few uh, uh, impacts to, potential impacts to, and, and real, I guess, or actual impacts to agriculture from here on out, or until we go to the hydro, hydro outlook part. So go, go ahead, Dennis. Okay, thank you very much, Doug. A couple things to spin off of what Doug already talked about. The, the combination of wet and cold conditions presents a couple problems because when you have colder than average conditions, that uh, limits the amount of evaporation from a soil. Uh, it, it, water evaporates more slowly, so when you have colder conditions, that uh, helps to limit the drying from soils. And we also are, are a bit behind in, in our crop growth and our plant growth this year. And to help dry our soils out, we need to, especially at, at, at deeper depths, not the surface, we need to get plants growing because that's really the only way we get uh, much of the excess water out of those at, at, at greater depths. So it's, it's that, that's why the combination of cold and wet is a real problem for us. Okay, we've looked at soil moisture. Let's look at soil temperature. This has an impact for agriculture. These are our, our soil temper, average soil temperatures as of yesterday, the areas that are in darker green and uh, to the, the, the lighter greens as you head further south are above 50 degrees Fahrenheit. That is an appropriate temperature for corn to grow and other plants to, other plants to, to start growing more actively. North of that, you're down in the 40s and up in North Dakota, you're still down in the, in the upper 30s in some places. Uh, when you're in the 40s, small grains like oats, wheats can grow. Uh, the the uh, when you're in the 30s, really not a whole lot of growth is going on at this point. So let's go ahead to the next slide. Um, you go ahead to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, one of the big impacts we've seen, probably the largest impact overall in agriculture, with these wet conditions, not only wet conditions but wet but uh, cold soils. Uh, we have uh, a lot of crop progress delays. Uh, the, the, the corn planted in the upper left hand, everything that's in brown, which is pretty much all the states where corn is actively grown, are behind planting. Um, Illinois and, and uh, Minnesota, the two worst. Uh, Minnesota, 2% of their corn is, is planted, which is 22% behind. Illinois, 9%, that's 34% behind uh, as of last Sunday. And there's really not been a whole lot of activity gone in a lot of these states. Iowa, 
uh, the areas where it's been actually been a little bit dry or a little better off than some of the other locations. Soybeans down below, you see a similar pattern. Those soybeans are not planted till later. Uh, winter wheat conditions, winter wheat is, uh, is planted in the fall and, and then uh, overwinters and starts regrowing. Um, so that does start to 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 re uh, regrow uh, before we get other plants in the ground. This is the comparison of how much is in good to excellent condition, and most of the the eastern Corn Belt states are quite a bit behind in wheat good in good to excellent conditions uh, because of the winter, the wet fall, and then overall uh, you know kind of uh, tough conditions so far this year. On the other hand, uh, in in the plain states. Most of the winter wheat conditions are well above average, uh, largely driven because the, the wet conditions have been positive out there uh, for the winter wheat, so it's actually in, in better condition than it usually is. This is something else I didn't address anywhere else, but our rangeland and our grass conditions out there, uh, despite the tough winter they've had, are probably gonna have quite a bit of growth, so livestock will have uh, plenty of forage out that way. Let's go ahead to the next slide here. But overall, for all the crops that we're dealing with, everything is, is well behind progress. And, we're, and because of the outlooks, we're not expecting to see too much going on here. Uh, here's oats, similar map from USDA, uh, courtesy, this is NAS data, USDA NAS, courtesy the uh, um, uh, World Agricultural Outlook Board. On the left-hand side, another issue we have, this is alfalfa. Alfalfa is, is a perennial, it keeps growing for a while. Uh, these little areas that are sticking up, these should be in the ground. So you're seeing uh, because of the frost heaving, frozen ground has forced this up out of the ground. Uh, there's a lot of alfalfa that has been damaged because of winter conditions. And uh, there is some concern in Ohio. This has happened over for all the states from, in, from Iowa to Ohio, but concerns in Ohio about having uh, forage for, for livestock in the area. Let's go ahead to the next slide. Uh, so a summary of, of, of a bunch of conditions now related to ag. Crop panting, as I mentioned, is delayed over much of the region. And especially from a corn standpoint, we are that we should be close to halfway planted and we're at about 20%. We're not gonna be making much more progress. Uh, so we're reaching a critical time where if we're too much more delayed, we're likely to see uh, yield loss. And that's what the really, uh, the later you're planted, the, the less your potential yield. Um, and it's not only been overall wet conditions uh, with, with excess rain, it's just been frequent rain in some places. If we had a few days of, of no rain in some of the eastern states, uh, extension folks reported there could be progress made, but you're getting rain every few days, so you have to wait for that to dry back out. Further south, uh, temperatures have been warmer, a little bit drier, we've been able to move ahead. Uh, we talked about crop conditions a little bit. Uh, and the winter alfalfa issues. An interesting situation related to ag in the Mississippi River. Because of the flooding situation on the Missouri River, it's been shut down to shipping. Uh, so there's not been any ability to move grain out. But then there's also fertilizer that has not been able, been able to come in. And there's still fertilization needing to go on this spring. And uh, there's been some places waiting on this delivery and it's likely not to happen because of the overall wet conditions. Let's go ahead to the next slide. Uh, some other issues with, with overall wet soils, increased chance for disease and poor emergence. Some, soil, some uh, plants that are in the ground planted already, sitting in cold wet ground for a long period of time, do not emerge well or they don't end up growing well and end up losing yield because of that. Uh, we have had some additional issues this spring. The wet fall, not a lot of people to do some field work. They've had to carry over to the spring. Um, many acres were, uh, have something that's called prevent plant. USDA, after essentially the, the floods in 1993, created a, 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 a part of crop insurance where if it was not appropriate to plant, you could get a, a, a partial settlement uh, for, for not planting because it was just not appropriate to be able to plant. There's gonna be a lot of acres that are likely gonna have that happen. We still, in, in the, uh, in, along the river areas, we do still have some flooded acres that are likely not to be planted and we still, uh, do have some acres in Nebraska that had that were uh, damaged because of flooding where you have uh, sand, other residues, and other trash uh, that were deposited there during the flooding that may not be planted this year either because we've not been able to do that. So uh, just included here on there also a copy of our Ag, our ag Outlook 
Uh, we do a, uh, right now we're doing a bi-weekly one because of the ongoing conditions where we address these issues related to ag. The link is there if you are interested in seeing that. And I'll hand it over to uh, the hydro folks now. All right, thanks, Dennis. This is this is Corey Loveland with the North Central River Forecast Center, and I'm the service coordination hydrologist here. And uh, Wendy Dennis did an excellent job covering uh, the overall hydrology and hitting the, the main points. I'm going to go into uh, some more detail into our basins here in the North Central River Forecast Center area. Uh, I've decided to separate into a few different uh, basins or groups here. Uh, to look at some of the details. And all the graphics I show are showing the latest observed stages up to date. Uh, and generally, for those who don't know, uh, when we categorize flooding, uh, there's generally three categories. Uh, major flooding, which is indicated in purple, moderate flooding uh, in red, and then minor flooding indicated in the orange color. Uh, sometimes you'll see a yellow or a green color, and those are uh, near normal or just above normal conditions there. So to talk about the, the first basin, the Red River of the North, uh, this map here shows uh, most of uh, North Dakota area. So uh, the, num the Red River of the North indicated here on the right side with that bar um, is basically we've seen uh, the majority of the flow uh, or the high flows that we've seen this season uh, barring any spring rains to, to bring them back up. So we anticipate a continuation of a slow recession along the Red River of the North area um, and kind of a slow or a, a steady flow or a slow recession of the tributaries contributing to the Red River of the North. Uh, some of the elevated river levels may continue through May, again, depending on the spring precipitation pattern and what comes up uh, here soon. Uh, most of the snow has melted uh, in the entire Red River of the North Basin. Uh, if you shift your eyes on the graphic to, to the left, I've got uh, the Surus Basin, where you can see Minot there. Uh, and then basically, the, no f significant rises are predicted there. Uh, some of the snow still remains near the Minot, uh, North Dakota area, with some trace amounts near the uh, Devil's Lake area there. And so the Surus Basin, uh, generally we haven't seen too many issues this, uh, this spring uh, and just mostly continuing to a recession. So let's go to the next slide, please. So now looking at the uh, Minnesota River and the upper Mississippi Rivers combined, uh, uh, most along uh, the Missis upper Mississippi area, we're forecasting for the uh, river levels to continue to decline. Uh, basically continuing a very a very slow fall. Uh, most of the levels along the river currently are uh, ranking in the moderate to minor flood going now. We've seen the majority of the snow melt uh, pass along um, uh, the upper Mississippi area, but we still are expecting high flows at least in the next week or uh, weeks to come. Uh, so th this segment is showing the upper Mississippi to uh, Dubuque, Iowa, and along that stretch, uh, again, we're seeing some major um, as you major flooding as you come uh, or go uh, towards uh, Dubuque there, uh, but mostly mostly in the minor category right now, minor and moderate uh, flood category. Uh, so in this segment, uh, we are expecting a continuation of a, a very slow fall, uh, mostly seeing a minor flooding, minor flood uh, floods during. Uh, for at least this week or uh, the near future. And again, that's uh, rainfall dependent. Uh, the railroad bridge at Dubuque, that's forecasted to be below major, uh, which is indicated in the hydrograph in that lower left area there. You can see it's currently in the purple and uh, slowly coming down into that uh, moderate flooding or the red. Uh, and we anticipate that to happen near Saturday uh, this weekend and um, moderate flooding there is uh, is 21 and a half feet. So next slide. Now looking more downstream on the Mississippi River, uh, basically from where we just left off from Nabuke all the way down to the lower end of our forecast area at St. Louis, Missouri. Uh, 
Uh, I think Wendy mentioned uh, near the Davenport area some of the issues that have, have happened there and, and possibly breaking the, the record, uh, the flow record and stage record of uh, uh, 1993. Uh, there's a hydrograph there on the far left of the Mississippi River at Rock Island, and you can see where that record level is at uh, 22.6, and I think that was in June of 1993. So we're right, uh, as you can see with the observation there, we're right there. So currently um, on the mid-Mississippi River, uh, which I call that there, uh, we're seeing major to moderate flooding, uh, mostly in the major category as uh, water is moving downstream and going through the locks and dams, uh, currently cresting uh, on the Mississippi near Comanche, Iowa right now uh, with continued rises near the Davenport, uh, Davenport Iowa and below. Uh, uh, to, to, to continue in major flooding in the near term. Uh, see, I mentioned the Rock Island near record. Uh, widespread two plus uh, uh, inches for the total seven day forecast is what we're seeing. Uh, that's gonna test both uh, the physical uh, levees and uh, uh, the barriers that are trying to hold that uh, water back, but also uh, people wise our mental fortitude as well as uh, we continue to have this long drawn out uh, flood uh, along the Mississippi River. Uh, and I think, um, I think Wendy mentioned as well that uh, this is the longest section of, uh, that we've seen in major flood near the Davenport area. It's, it, today is the 40th day. And with the uncertainty in the rain forecast, this duration of flooding could continue even longer. Uh, I just wanted to also mention that uh, both the Illinois and Missouri River uh, rivers um, are tributaries to the Mississippi and they'll uh, continue to add uh, significant water uh, just above St. Louis, Missouri. Right now, um, uh, the flow is currently around 600,000 cubic feet per second on the Mississippi below the Missouri River. And uh, looking at, uh, we're looking at seeing the second highest flows on record in the St. Louis area right now. Let's go to the next side, please. Okay, so Illinois, uh, we've seen uh, a number of, or, or a lot of action on the Illinois right now, uh, mostly in the major to minor categories, but mostly uh, levels going in or uh, into major or they're within major flood stage right now. You can see the hydrograph there at the Illinois River at Morris there on the upper left-hand side there, uh, cresting here uh, soon. Uh, maybe today or tomorrow near the 23 and a half uh, foot stage there. Uh, so this graphic here, you can see where um, uh, I've outlined, you can see where Peoria is and kind of mid, uh, mid Illinois area here. Uh, we're forecasting that the Illinois will add significant water to the Mississippi River during this time of long duration and high water. Uh, again, adding to the stresses on the levee and the water control systems. Uh, Central and Southern Illinois, uh, the next seven days is uh, forecast to receive uh, three plus inches. Uh, so that's pretty significant rainfall in the next seven days. So that's just going to add to the, the water in the system. So along this stretch, we're continuing the, uh, the forecast uh, or the forecast has continued to rise on the Illinois River. Uh, so again, very high levels are going to continue in the next few weeks. And uh, depending on the rainfall amounts and frequency, Right now, the outflow of the Illinois is about 70,000 cubic feet per second uh, going into the Mississippi River. And the next slide, I uh, wanted to separate this out, is we've got uh, the current flood status on the St. Joseph, Yellow, the Kankakee, and the Iroquois Rivers. Uh, we've seen some uh, high flows and those, uh, those tributaries uh, to, the, to the Mississippi. We're seeing near crests on the St. Joseph and the Yellow Rivers. Uh, the Kankakee is uh, 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 forecast to continue to rise in the next week or so with, uh, again, a potential record uh, within major flood stage at, at Shelby near 13 feet, uh, possibly over this weekend. Uh, the Iroquois River uh, down south is cresting now um, or currently cresting right now or, or soon rather and within minor flood levels. And again, forecasted rainfall within the next seven days will keep these levels up and prolong the, the recessions of those uh, tributaries. So next slide. 
Uh, looking at the uh, flood potential outlook, got these outlined for the Hudson Bay, which is basically uh, the Suris River and the Red River, the North Basins. Uh, got this zoomed in here. Uh, you can see the Devil's Lake area and Grand Forks off to the right uh, to get your bearings there. Uh, so mostly nothing really has changed in the Suris River Basin. That's uh, you know the flood potential outlook basically through now, through late July. Uh, not seeing too much of a change, just near normal to slightly above normal flood risk there. Uh, same thing with uh, the inflows into Devil's Lake area. Uh, the, the highlight here is essentially the, the southern, or not the southern, the lower part of the Red River of the north uh, indicated there with that bracket there. Uh, that's got the highest flood potential. Uh, but again, the Red River of the north is mostly receding right now, depending on the spring rains that, that happen. Um, and then above to much above normal flood risk uh, in that lower, uh, and again, in that lower third part of the basin. And then next slide, uh, looking at the Wisconsin the Upper Peninsula basins uh, for the flood potential outlook through late uh, July. Uh, it's kind of been, uh, I guess, the sleeping beast a little bit uh, with, uh, uh, with the snow, higher than normal snow. Uh, snowfall in the Upper Peninsula in the Wisconsin area uh, combined with the saturated soils with the rainfall and uh, the cooler temperatures here. Uh, the snowpack, or I mean, sorry, the, the rainfall remains, uh, again, some uncertainty. But uh, given these levels, we'll see um, uh, see some uh, higher flows within uh, within these basins here. Next slide. And then lastly, looking at uh, um, the Mississippi Basin here, uh, generally, you know, as we've seen and, and showed, we've got higher than normal flows. Those are anticipated to continue uh, at least through May and possibly into July with several peaks uh, in June timeframe with, uh, with the, the spring rains and, and those uh, spring run, uh, rain patterns. So again, an ab above to much above normal flood risk continues basically throughout the whole Mississippi, the Minnesota River, the headwaters of the Mississippi, and along the main stem uh, down through uh, and below uh, St. Louis, Missouri. So really the, the river hasn't had a chance uh, to come back down from the spring runoff uh, that we've seen. So as wide uh, spring rains continue, uh, again, the levels of the river will remain high. And then, as again, as we see the Illinois River and the Missouri River come in, it's kind of the, the worst of the situations where we have all the tributaries uh, high at the, uh, in the, at the same time contributing into the Mississippi. We'll continue to see the widespread uh, flooding, and especially with uh, the saturated soils that really haven't had a chance to, to dry out yet. So uh, even with a little bit of rainfall, less than an inch, uh, we, we will see um, higher higher flows and even uh, receive some peaks there. So that's all I had, and I think I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Lau with Missouri Basin. Okay, thank you, Corey. Um, so just a continuing saga, I suppose. So uh, again, my name is Kevin Lau. I'm with the Missouri Basin River Forecast Center in Kansas City, and, and um, I'll talk to you this afternoon a bit about the Missouri Basin. So this first slide uh, shows the current conditions within the or the current uh, flooding situation within the Missouri Basin. The the eastern portion of the Missouri Basin continues to be very hydrologically active. Um, this graphic shows locations that are currently in flood, or at least as of yesterday were in flood. And Corey has already pointed out that uh, the colors um, uh, purple and um, red and orange uh, indicate uh, major, moderate, and minor, respectively. Uh, and then I've put some text boxes in there to speak about particular rivers and or river basins where flooding is going on right now. So um, go ahead and go to slide two, if you would. And we'll look at the mountains. And, and Doug Cluck's already uh, showed a, um, a similar graphic earlier. This graphic uh, also comes from the Natural Resources Conservation Service. And uh, my graphic here shows the mountainous basin snowpack conditions in percent of median snow water equivalent. We have added uh, some high elevation snows over the past few days in the mountains. 
Uh, but even with that, we believe that we have already reached and are beginning to come down from our um, overall accumulated snow water peak, uh, which happened uh, in mid-April. Uh, we have begun to see some higher elevation melt above 7,500 feet, but it is not well established yet. But there is some of the snow coming off. Um, I would caution folks, uh, once we are past the typical peak accumulation date, which is tax, uh, uh, typically tax day, April 15th, uh, you kind of have to um, uh, look at these percentages with uh, a little bit of, um, uh, got to critique them, I guess, or or don't let them spook you too much. It's not unusual to have uh, over 100% uh, once you went past the, the, the normal peak date, and that doesn't necessarily mean a bad thing. Uh, percentages, I guess, sort of uh, run high on the, uh, on the uh, recession side. Uh, overall, as has already been said this afternoon, we are basically uh, at average to perhaps slightly above average uh, mountain snowpack with regard to the water equivalent that's, um, that's banked away in that snow. We continue not to look or continue to say that uh, we don't expect significant flooding from mountain melt. Now, there's always the chance for, for minor flooding depending on rain. Um, that's always a possibility, but right now we still think that we are uh, uh, sitting good, if you will, with respect to being able to take the melt off without uh, significant impact. The next slide shows uh, our, our water supply forecast. As I've said before on these calls, we issue a, a volumetric uh, water supply forecast through the end of September, uh, much like the Natural Resources Conservation Service does. And even though the graphic you see here is from April, we actually did our May forecast yesterday. We don't have an updated graphic, but I do have updated numbers and they did not change uh, much at all from this April graphic. And so basically we're expecting a normal to slightly above normal mountain runoff season. Um, so so that's, that's, that's uh, a plus in our favor too with regard to flooding, that's a positive. Uh, the next slide, I will now talk about uh, the flood outlooks within the Missouri Basin for the next three months. Uh, I've already shown, or my first slide uh, was showing a graphic with ongoing flooding, and so uh, beginning with this, this slide and the next two slides, I'll talk about what we expect over the next 90 days. And I'll uh, first begin with the James River Basin. Uh, the current water that's being translated through the James Basin is likely to be the 2019 crest. Uh, some locations will remain above flood stage for several weeks into months. Uh, that is not um, unheard of for the James. Uh, but basically, um, uh, above Forestburg, we've already seen the 2019 crest. And um, below Forestburg, what we expect to happen over the next couple of weeks will, should be, should be the ultimate, uh, the highest uh, peak for this year. With the next slide, we'll move a bit east. Uh, both the Big and the Little Sioux Rivers are still in flood, as indicated in that very first slide I showed. Uh, both of these rivers, as well as the Floyd River, still will have the potential for renewed flooding over the next three months. Uh, again, we have uh, hopefully seen the 2019 uh, overall peak, though, on all three of these rivers, Big and Little Sioux and Floyd. Moving south, and this will be my last slide with regard to the outlook, um, the lower third of the basin, uh, there's ongoing flooding uh, uh, going on, <laughs> uh, still in the lower third, primarily in the state of Missouri and along the main stem Missouri River downstream and including Nebraska City, Nebraska. Um, thunderstorm activity is the primary driver uh, from this point forward and we can expect on again, off again flooding in eastern Kansas, southeastern Nebraska, western Iowa, and across the entire state of Missouri during the next 90 days. The Missouri main stem itself will re remain vulnerable to moderate level flooding through the summer. The Missouri River is currently in flood, uh, basically from Nebraska City, Nebraska to its mouth, 
uh, with the exception of the Kansas City reach, and that is a uh, so it's in flood for basically uh, 500 miles. Some locations along the Missouri probably won't fall below flood stage until June. And so for my sum summary slide, um, mountain snowpack is near average. Uh, we should be on the downward trend as far as um, uh, uh, the snow melt is a uh, snow pack that's, that's out there now. We should be uh, beginning to deplete that snowpack. Uh, we do not expect widespread or significant flooding from mountain snow melt. And as already been said time and again, I guess on this call due to the wet soils, and the ongoing very high stream flows, there doesn't ex uh, exist an enhanced risk for continued episodic on again, off again flooding across the entire eastern portion of the Missouri River Basin. And uh, this concludes the uh, my brief, and I'll turn it back over to Wendy. All right, thank you, Kevin. Um, we do have some questions, but I uh, is this something you wanted to talk about? No, okay. Um, Everybody said uh, pretty much what we just said there. I will say this, uh, there will be a recording and a PDF, I hope, on these two locations at the High Plains Regional Climate Center and the Midwestern Regional Climate Center uh, in, a, in um, 24 to 48 hours, hopefully. Uh, you can check either or both of those. We will have another webinar on May 16th, at 1 p.m. on Thursday, Central Daylight Time. Uh, the primary presenter will be Martha Sholsky, who's the ne Nebraska State Climatologist. I imagine will enlist some of the uh, fatigued hydrologists from the National Weather Service to help out uh, if uh, conditions uh, if conditions stay about the same as they are today, or even less than a little bit. Um, anything you want to say about this? No, these are just links. Um, these are contacts for the presenters, for their emails if you have follow-up questions. Um, and the information about the hydrologic outlook can be found at this URL. And then our real-time uh, updated river forecasts are available at the waterweather.gov website listed there. Okay. So if you have a question or anything, a uh, comment, uh, feel free to type it into the question area. Uh, we're going to answer a bunch of questions here. People are leaving before we can answer their questions, but we're going to try anyway. Uh, one of the first questions was, is this wetness the new normal? And uh, that's a rather, it's an easy question to ask, but a much, much more complex question to answer. Um, the only thing I'll say about that, and um, others on this call can chime in, um, uh, panelists, uh, it, it, we have seen increased uh, precipitation across the Midwest since about the 1950s. Uh, when you compare this last 30 years to the period of record before that, uh, you definitely see uh, more precipitation in the last 30 years as a whole across a general area. Uh, is it the new normal to have uh, this type of flooding, this much flooding? No. No, this isn't normal. This is uh, pretty abnormal, and it took a lot of things coming together to make it happen, okay? Um, so that's that's my answer to that. There's some there's a lot more we could talk about that. Anybody want to say anything? Okay. Uh, next question was, and this one's a little harder for me to answer, so I'm going to ask Wendy to handle it. Um, how does the Corps of Engineers storage? Actually, we should ask the Corps of Engineers to handle it. Uh, Corps of Engineers storage capacity relate to major slash record river stage. With storage capacity in the 10 to 40 percent range, uh, it appears storage is available to lower the river stage. So, in the Weather Service River Forecast process, we are in continuous collaboration with the water management units in the Corps of Engineers district, um, and um, we provide information about the precipitation forecast and estimates of inflow um, to their reservoir systems. Um, and the Corps does what they can um, with their water management rules um, to utilize the flood storage that they have. So um, we are continually talking with them and collaborating and sharing information. And uh, our forecasts reflect uh, what they do with their reservoir out. And actually, that is a much 
better question for the Corps of Engineers. And if you need a contact, uh, we we have those, so you can you can ask us. Uh, this one from um, Bryce. I'm going to skip yours and go to the next one, then come back to yours. Are you hearing uh, if farmers are having trouble with manure spreading due to wet soils or floods? Manure lagoons are probably getting full by now. Dennis. Yes. Uh, basically, if you're not able to get out on fields, uh, you're not able to spread manure, and we've had an extended period of cold. So yes, uh, particularly in the eastern Corn Belt, I've heard of problems with uh, spreading manure. Also, the the point, uh, Dennis, uh, you may you might want to explain a little bit more about spreading manure um, when it's going to rain two or three inches in saturated soils and how that's not very uh, well. Go ahead. Yes. Uh, well, briefly, the longer version, uh, many states require you during the winter to confine manure from a confined operation and you can't spread it on snow. Uh, and then by the springtime, when you're wanting to be, to be spreading manure, uh, several states have enacted regulations that you cannot spread manure uh, X amount of time before expected rainfalls. Why? Because if you're putting manure on top of a field or not incorporating it, if you get a rainfall, uh, that manure now runs into the nearest stream. So that is an effort to try to improve water quality issues, as well as protect the, uh, the, 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 the reason manure is applied to field, it has a fertilizing uh, impact. So that's the longer version. Thank you, Dennis. And now for the $64,000 question. Thank you, Bryce, for asking it. It, it is a pertinent question. We're getting, we're getting questions about this as well, so we'll address it. Um, it hasn't been handled already, by the way, as you, as you suggest. Uh, but it looks to me like there's a lot of resemblance to 1993 flooding. Any thoughts on that and thanks? So um, in some cases, uh, we have uh, broken a couple records from 1993, as the hydrologist pointed out. And please, uh, 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 Kevin and Corey uh, and anybody else, really, uh, feel free to, to come in on that angle. What I would say, though, in terms of um, sort of a climatological setup or a weather setup, for that matter, uh, for comparing 1993 to this year, we had a bit of a discussion yesterday about this sort of internally. And uh, what I will say, uh, what I think I can say um, from what I understand about the situation and the mo what the models are showing and such about the future is that there does tend, there is sort of a, um, uh, what we call a trough, a semi-persistent sort of troughing, if you will, to our west, meaning uh, a Great Basin area. That's trying to, in the forecast, the models are sort of showing that for the next month or two. Um, that in and of itself is, it, it's a little bit displaced in terms of where that sits. And I'll tell you why it's important in just a moment. Um, uh, in 1993, that troughiness, if you will, was set up by the Canadian border, uh, maybe a little bit down into uh, Montana. This is more centered, uh, Great Basin, sort of a little further west and south of that. Uh, generally, what that sort of indicates, uh, if, if we do get that sort of pattern set up in the atmosphere, it can enhance precipitation across certainly the high plain or the plains high plains um in, into the midwest but it is um highly dependent upon all, it's highly dependent upon a number of different other climatological pieces that have to fit together to get a 93 sort of situation where you have a rain event every other day or every day for that matter uh uh I would say this, just as a generality, conditions are probably a little wetter across, from a soil moisture point of view, across the uh, across this area than they were in '93, and um, that's not helpful, obviously, for flooding concerns. Um, if we were to get that sort of pattern set up, yes, uh, that could be that could be troublesome. It's very hard for us to forecast that 
very solidly right now, but for an awareness point of view, um, it's, it's certainly good to be aware that, you know, um, I'm not saying 93 is going to repeat. It's not going to repeat, repeat. But I am saying that, uh, like I said the last on the last call like this, uh, conditions are such that it wouldn't take a lot to have any kind of flooding, let alone 1993 flooding, which is, um, you know, a, a lot more rain. So I don't know, Dennis and the hydro, uh, Kevin and um, Corey. I'll, I'll 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 take a swing at the ag side. Um, the the to I don't want to ever repeat say a repeat of something, but the there are some similarities and the potential for some serious things even with because the, from this point on in '93 there were some additional things happened some additional big rainfalls that happened in 1993. We can't say that is going to repeat. The potential for causing problems in the ag, and I'll let the hydro folks talk about this too, are they exist right now even without large additional rainfalls. We have wet soils that are not drying out very quickly, and with this repeated situation of regular rainfall events, even without big, big events, that's going to slow down additional crop progress. So additional problems are at least some problems are almost guaranteed. How big the problems are is, is really dependent on what happens over the next few weeks, on the ag side anyway. Kevin Lau, do you have any comment? Well, um, so as far as stages go, we've already exceeded 93 uh, upstream of Kansas City. The, uh, the mid-March event, um, exceeded 93 at Nebraska City, Brownville, Rulo, and St. Joe. So the ne Nebraska City, the St. Joe reach has already seen 93 again. Um, in some respects, we can't repeat 93 from a hydrologic standpoint because of the levee breaches that have already occurred. Um, so, you know, <laughs> however you want to take that, that, you know, good thing or bad thing, but um, it would be hard to attain some of the some of the uh, water levels simply because of the conditions of the levees on the main stem. So, but we did, um, you know, in '93 we we had a very wet June. Uh, I think we had two separate seven plus inch events, seven inch rain events in the uh, in the Missouri Basin. Um, so, anyway, that's really all I've got to say. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, just a comment that uh, Fremont County, Iowa, they're going to be in flood stage uh, probably through August, according to this person, and that uh, um, all kinds of things like hog confinement areas are flooded, and um, of course that's not good for anybody downstream. So. Uh, Lots of levees broken in that area as well. And, and, and Dennis mentioned Nebraska uh, issues. Uh, those also should probably be Nebraska, Iowa, Missouri in terms of uh, agricultural use of land and not getting anything planted this year. So uh, that's all I have for questions. I appreciate all of your um, your time and concern, and you're on this for obvious reasons. So, um, I, I, you know, all, all we can say is stay tuned, call your local weather office for updates, call us if you care to. Uh, you know, th that's why we're here. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Corey. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, and thank you, Ryan, who didn't say anything, but that's okay. Well, yes, did he say anything? I don't remember. We didn't have him say anything. All right, well, that's okay. If uh, conditions would have been worse than the Ohio, we probably would have uh, brought him in or if there were any questions. But anyway, thank you all, and thank everybody who came to this. We appreciate your um, attendance and participation. Have a great day and weekend. <laughs>